Hi everyone, my name is Shweta Sharan. I am one of the admins of Bangalore Schools Group. Uh, today is a, a very exciting day. This is day two of the Bangalore Education Online Expo. This is the first expo to be conducted by the parent community, Manoj, Sandhya and I, our parents. And today it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next uh, uh, presenter, Rupa Pai. Rupa Pai is one of India's best known writers for children. She's written over 20, uh, 25 books, ranging from picture books to chapter books and fiction to non-fiction. She has written books like The Vedas and Upanishads for Children and uh, The Gita for Children, one of the best-selling books in India. And when she's not writing, she loves uh, uh, you know, uh, interacting with children and young people and talking to them about history and heritage. I've been on one of her uh, you know, uh, walking tours in Bangalore uh, a year ago. So uh, Rupa today will be doing a very exciting session based on uh, a book she wrote recently. Uh, she will take us through 2,500 years of medical history and talk about the stories of men and women from across the world who, uh, whose curiosity and hard work has really helped us to live a, a better, more disease-free life. A very fitting topic for the pandemic that we find ourselves in. So over to you, Rupa. Uh, have a great session, and I can't wait to, uh, you know, share it. Thank you. Thank you, Shweta, for that lovely introduction. And uh, yeah, very happy to be here as part of Bangalore School's online expo. Very happy to be presenting to whoever is here. And really, the subject of medicine and health is so much back in focus. I mean, you know, I hope there are parents here as well. It's really open to anyone because this is a subject that interests anyone. Uh, but it wasn't like this, you know, when it about uh, this this book the, on which today's um, uh, today's talk is based on is called From Leeches to Slug Glue, 25 Explosive Ideas That Made and Are Making Modern Medicine. And it came out about a year ago. And a year before that, when my editor at Penguin was asking me, you know, you pick a topic, write about anything. And I know you like to write about nonfiction, pick, uh, pick some topic. And I said, you know what? I went back home, I thought about it, and I came up with this, what I thought was a brilliant idea. I said, why don't I write on the history of medicine for children? And she gave me a very, that kind of look. And she said, really? History of medicine for children? Why would that be interesting? I mean, is, is the history of medicine interesting? I mean, it feels like it'll just be full of blood and gore. And, um, and is it like, does it have exciting stories? Because she really had no idea at all. And I realized then that a lot of people had no idea about the history of medicine. In fact, what I came to know once the book was released and it was uh, launched in a ceremony held in the St. John's Medical College in Bangalore, they have a library of the medical of the history of medicine. They have a museum of the history of medicine there. And it was under the ages of that that this book was launched. And the doctor who was curating the museum and who helped me launch the book he told me that even medical students, unfortunately, do not study the history of medicine. They start right away with subjects related to the body, but they don't study the history of their own profession, which if they did, would give them a far greater appreciation of who they are and what kind of legacy they are the, uh, they are the inheritors of. You know, so they would feel a greater sense of, oh my God, we doctors, we are bringing forward this huge legacy. And I realized that, you know, and, and the, I realized that I probably knew a little bit of all this because in my own sister is a doctor and in my own family, I counted when I when the book was about to be launched, I counted in my own very close cousins and family. There are 15 doctors, no less than 15 and different specializations. So probably I had seen a doctor's life from up close right from because of my older sister, from the effort that goes into finishing that course itself how difficult it is, how much you have to work and study, how hard you have to work in 11th and 12th and perhaps now even in 9th and 10th to make sure that you get a seat in a medical college, in a good medical college. And then there's five and a half years of really hard work and a lot of sacrifice. So now count, it's already seven and a half years, including 11th and 12th of really hard work and a lot of sacrifices. You have to give up a lot of social events. You have to give up a lot of uh, leisure events like just chilling out of the movie, which every other person, especially engineering students, and I know this because I'm an engineer myself, we have a lot of time for all that. 
medical students themselves don't have the time for that because they are studying so much. And then I realized that anybody who commits to this field of study, right, that means they are the best people to be doctors because even after they finish their medicine, even after they finish another three years of specialization, even after they finish another three years after that of super specialization, their lives never get any easier. They are always making sacrifices so that they can serve ill people. And I thought to myself, this is a very special kind of person who chooses, who knowing this, knowing that their whole life will be a series of sacrifices, chooses to become a doctor. And you, what had begun to really hurt me one and a half, two years ago, was that my sister who had studied so hard to get in, studied so hard to complete her specialization, which is, she's a gynecologist. And, uh, you know, 25 years later is still working so hard because, you know, gynecologist is a, is a very difficult profession because babies don't, the gyne, a gynecologist is who? A gynecologist is, is the kind of doctor who delivers babies. And babies have no timetable. They will come whenever they like. Babies are not going to say, okay, oh, doc, you're only working from nine to five. You have a party tonight. Okay. You know what? I'm going to come out before five o'clock so that you can go chill out. No, not at all. Babies will say, Acha, you're having a party tonight. Excellent. Thanks for telling me because I will make sure that I come out right when you're in the middle of your party. And then you have to leave that party and you have to come, come back to the hospital because I will decide to be born at that time. So I have seen how much sacrifice. But what I noticed was different between the time when she graduated about 25, uh, 28 years ago. And now was that I mean, now I mean about one and a half years ago when I decided to write. No. Uh, about uh, two years ago when I decided to write this book was that when she first became a gynecologist, everyone was treating her like a goddess. All the patients, she would come home laden with homemade biryani and sweets and silk saris that her very grateful patients brought to her as gifts. And I thought to myself, man, this is a very good gig. You know, you shouldn't be a doctor. You should be a doctor's sister. You get to eat the best food. You get to have a choice of wonderful saris because how many saris can she have? And you don't have to do any of the work. This is the best. And I thought to myself, okay, good. Good that you're very service minded and you work so hard. You please do that work while I sit and enjoy the benefits of it. But of course, I had huge respect and admiration for her and all her friends. Um, so that was then. And then, you know, about two years ago, what had happened was, by that time, doctors were not being treated like goddesses. She was working just as hard. But people had begun to say the most awful things about doctors. And perhaps some of them were true. But all the doctors I knew, I could see they were really, they were no different. They were working just as hard. But the kind of general impression that the general public had about doctors was that, oh my God, you must have heard it in your family. Somebody saying it, you know, if, to the children listening, that, Oh, doctors, they're just in it to make the money. You know, they send you for all these expensive tests. They have these tie ups with labs and the lab will charge you so much for a completely unnecessary test. And then half that money will go to the doctor. That is why doctors recommend tests. You know, all these awful things, making it out as if they were like some common criminals who are just trying to and very corrupt and just looking to make money. And the other thing that had happened was loss of confidence in hospitals hospitals which used to be places where you were like little temples where you could go and get cured and come back had become people had started talking about hospitals as oh god if you get into a hospital they will bankrupt you you'll never come out with one paisa in your pocket and they don't care for you they just care to fill the beds all kinds of things and the third thing that had begun to happen was that western medicine which is which is really all the medicine we use right now most of the medicine Anything you can think of, whether you're thinking of a syringe, whether you're thinking of a pill, whether you're thinking of a vaccination, whether you're thinking of an antibiotic, whatever you think of surgery, you know, the kind of surgery that's being done today. All this is part of modern medicine is a better word for it than Western medicine. But it was mostly developed in the West in the last 200 years or so. So it's sometimes called Western medicine. So people have started saying really awful things about Western medicine itself, about modern. Oh, my God, they put poison into your bodies. And uh, in America, there was a group of people, uh, I mean, like a quite strong lobby of people called anti-vaxxers, not wax, not, not candle wax or uh, that kind of wax, but vax, which is vaccine. People who were against vaccines and would refuse to take vaccines because they thought vaccines were poison. 
And I thought to myself, my God, how things have changed in just 25, 26 years. And what has happened was even treating the doctor like a goddess was an extreme thing and treating them like criminals is another extreme thing. And the truth actually lies in between. Doctors are people just like us, but they, are, they spend their li lives saving other people's lives. And that should put them a little notch higher than the rest of us. Uh, so I, at least I felt that because I had seen the amount of sacrifice. So I thought to myself, you know, it's this whole generation of children will not even know what it takes and what it took so many people for so many centuries to, to, uh, to allow us to live the kind of lives we do in the 21st century, which is pain free largely, which is much longer than people used to live 100, 150 years ago, which is largely disease free. You know, this could, I mean, you can't even imagine what it was like, not 2000 years ago, just 150, 180, 200 years ago, if you had lived, you would have lived a very different kind of life. So we are very, very lucky to live in the 21st century when modern medicine has made such progress in the last 150 years or 180 years. And I wanted to share that story with children. And that is why I wrote this book. So, and, and I wrote this book one year ago, it came out and yeah, people, people enjoyed the stories in it. And they said, no, we didn't know it was so interesting and all that. But in the, the way I've written in this book is like as if every disease, this huge monster disease conquered, that huge uh, big problem with surgery conquered, this problem conquered, as if we had come to the pinnacle of everything. And then just four months or five months later, something we had never, ex a global pandemic hits. And suddenly we are at our wits end again. Again, we have to go back to the drawing board. Again, we have to figure out how to cure this new disease. We realize we haven't conquered anything at all. We have, we have conquered a lot, but there's a lot more left. And you know, the kind of thing we feel, oh, we know everything. We actually don't know anything at all. And it's nature's way to, to throw fresh challenges at us all the time to keep us busy and active and innovative and constantly using our imagination and our smarts to, to, uh, to, uh, to solve a new problem that humanity has. And I thought, wow, this is, this would be the this would be a good thing to talk about today because we are in the middle of a, another pandemic and suddenly once again thank god but doctors healthcare workers these people are once again at the forefront people are like oh please save us and what about western medicine everybody is looking to western medicine or modern medicine again saying you are the only guys who can save us so so please do whatever so all that talk that was going on so much 2 years ago is now under the carpet and once again, doctors and healthcare workers are up and scientists who are working to figure out how to solve this new challenge are right up on the top. And what the biggest thing we can take away from uh, my now I feel from this book, what I can take away, what makes me hopeful is that so many deadly pandemics in the past, we are not alone. This is not we are not some extremely cursed generation that this should happen to us. Oh, my God, why did it never happen to anybody else? We are the worst. We are the most cursed. Not at all. People have led entire generations of people have led far worse lives because of all kinds of disease. And still the human spirit and the human will and the human innovation and imagination and compassion has conquered it all. So that is what we should take hope from and say this will also this too shall pass because human beings are smart and compassionate and they will find a way you know people are working so hard so hard so many people we can keep saying uh you know that vaccine will never come this but people are working very very hard and so we will get through this okay so now coming to some stories from the history of medicine uh let's see so um, I want to start with one thing, though, uh, considering that Navaratri is starting today and it's like celebration of the female, of the feminine, sacred feminine, the goddess. So did you know that India in India, we have a, one of the worst pandemics, worst diseases that existed uh, until about 200, 250 years ago was called smallpox. It was a scourge. You know, it used to affect, it used to it travel very, very quickly through droplets, through sneezing, through contact, just like the coronavirus, it used to trans, and that was a virus too, but okay, I'll take, come to that. So it used to tra travel really fast 
and um, it used to take away i mean people used to die like flies from it and even if they did not die they used to have these pock marks all over their faces you know it was a rash it was a lot of pustules and boils used to come all over the body inside the mouth everywhere and when the scabs fell off those people would be disfigured for life the marks stayed really really ugly marks and if the smallpox went into your ears you could be left deaf for life if it went into your eyes you could be left blind for life so it was a terrible disease and it has been around for the longest time but today we don't have smallpox once a vaccine for smallpox was uh, was discovered that biggest scourge of humanity which has been mentioned in the vedas also was was now was now over and done with okay and we have a goddess of smallpox in india uh, so i just wanted to tell you that that little bit of trivia because it's navratri before we begin and uh, what was her name i'm sure many of you know perhaps some of the older people in your family might know because smallpox was present when they were uh, young perhaps even in bang even in uh, india she was called shitla devi or sheetala devi and in the south she's called mariamman okay and she she has she holds she has four arms and what does she hold in her arms so she was the uh, goddess of skin diseases pox everything and she could either curse you to get it or she could bless you and save you so what were the four things she held in her four arms in in one hand she held a broom okay which was to clean the area around the patient in another hand she held a pot of water you know to help bring down the temperature of the body in another hand she held uh, a fan once again to cool the person who was ill and whose uh, body temperature had become too high and in her fourth hand she held neem leaves a bunch of neem leaves and today even today neem is used as something to soothe uh, itchy and uh, burning skin so right from the ancient days in india we knew that cleanliness was we didn't know why perhaps but we knew cleaning the area around a patient was where hygiene was really important to um cure disease or to prevent disease okay okay fine so i just wanted to leave you with that little nugget and then i i've said you know i think shweta said that 2500 years of medical history has been covered in this book of course not every single high point but most of the high points and it has gone from it has gone through several geographies because west what we like to call as western medicine or modern medicine yes in the last 3 400 years the focus has shifted to the west that is where all the innovation has come from but don't don't imagine that, that it's always been the west you know for about 1000 years from about 300 ad to 1300 ad the west was in a complete paralysis of of knowledge it was called the dark ages nothing happened for a thousand years and at that time who was making great strides before that it was india and greece but in the middle who were the which was the uh, which empire or which part of the world was making the greatest progress it was the islamic empire which covered a large part of asia africa and some parts of europe as well so that is where the real innovation was coming from so this book traces all that so that we get an understanding that nobody owns knowledge knowledge is for all humanity and who is making the greatest progress at a particular time depends on very many things the politics you know the geography or where science is respected you know that that depends but when they did find things they always shared it with everybody else so that humanity as a whole progressed and that's exactly what is happening now right so let's go back then if let's go back 2500 years ago and if it was an more interactive thing if you were sitting in front of me live i would have asked you to guess a lot of things but since that is not possible now i'm going to give you the answers myself but i'll just raise the questions and give the answers so that you get a chance to think about it so the question i usually ask is 2500 years ago if there were a medical olympics right which three civilizations would have ended up as podium finishers in the sense which would be on the podium which would uh, i'm not sure which would win gold which would win silver which would win bronze because it would depend on what was being tested but in medical knowledge in general which three were among the top civilizations in the world and the answer is the greeks the chinese and the indians so we were uh, really far ahead of the field uh, in every way and um, india particularly had two not not at the same time they were not contemporaries but 
across, you know, from 2,500 years ago till about 2,000, uh, uh, 1,900, 1,800 years ago. Uh, in that period, there were two amazing medical men that we talk about even today. And what they contributed to the world was huge. And one of them was a physician, which means he didn't do surgeries, but he, he um, had the mortar and the pestle and he knew so much about, I mean, generally ancient Indians, a lot of ancient Indians, there was a lot of knowledge in ancient India about plants and trees and flowers and herbs and roots and what could be put together with what to make somebody better or to make somebody ill. Because, yeah, that was also part of the you know, knowledge of plants and uh, trees and, and general botany. So a lot of information was there on that. And this man was a physician and he put together a compendium of all kinds of cures for all kinds of things. And this physician's name was Charaka. That's right. Now, uh, but there was also a surgeon and he lived in Varanasi, uh, Banaras Kashi. That is where he was born and lived. And his he was a surgeon and he made some very important contributions, not just the first Indian to do it, but among the first in the world to do it. And his name was Sushruta. And he put together a compendium as well called the Sushruta Samhita. And that was a compendium on surgery. And I just want to try and share my screen now and show you um, Sushruta, what he looked like, sort of. I mean, we have to imagine what he looked like, of course. But let's see. This is an artist's uh, representation, of course. But yeah, so if you can see it, that is Sushruta. He's the father of surgery, right? I hope you can all see this. Uh, and there is a hint there itself in that slide about, uh, one sec, yeah, about what he was a master of. In fact, he was a master, he was a pioneer in two things. One of the things that he was a master of was uh, surgery, ah, sorry, was uh, cosmetic surgery. What is cosmetic surgery? It's a reconstructive surgery is another name for it. That means you reconstruct part of, today we also call it plastic surgery. So suppose somebody has been in an accident and has lost, you know, his face has been disfigured. Maybe his cheek has gone off or something. You reconstruct that part so that he or she can live a full life and doesn't look disfigured. So our teeth are gone, jaw is broken. So that all these are done by reconstructive surgeons or plastic surgeons. And Sushruta, the ancient Indian surgeon Sushruta, was an expert at plastic surgery. And which were the two parts of the face that he was a master at reconstructing? Again, I'm just leaving a little pause for you to think about it. So if you can come up with the answers, pretend that I'm listening and throw the answers at me and then I will tell you the right answer. So the right answer was that he was a master at reconstructing the nose and the ears of people who had lost them for some reason or something. Now, when, you, when I read this fact, I was like, but why? Why would there be so much demand for reconstructing noses and ears. I mean, how many of us smash our noses and ears and need them to be reconstructed today? Uh, did ancient Indians keep walking into doors or did they keep getting their ears caught in something? I mean, why, why did they have to, why did they lose their uh, noses and ears so much and need reconstruction? And then when I read up a little more and researched a little more, I realized, and some of you may have already guessed this, that in times of war and you had a sword, Whatever extremity stuck out, that was an easy thing to, dis to damage, right? So a lot of times in war, your nose and ears got damaged. The other thing was it was actually a punishment, a most humiliating punishment to disfigure somebody's face by cutting off their nose and ears. And this was done to prisoners of war, like you're a prisoner and your king has failed. And now as a humiliation, I will do this to you because you continue to live after that. But you will just look really odd, like Voldemort without a nose and ears. So that, that's what they used to do. And the other thing, they used to also do this to criminals. So that when they finally left prison and walked the streets again, they would always be branded for life as, ah, he must have been a criminal. Look, his nose and ears are gone. Okay, and that is why Sushruta, out of compassion or out of whatever, he's found a need to develop a way to reconstruct people's noses and ears because he probably believed and he was right if he, that's what he believed. But we all know that it's not right to brand somebody for life because of one or two misdemeanors. We all make mistakes. 
right so and we should always offer a chance for redemption so why should somebody be branded for life that no he was a criminal that's a terrible thing to do so sushruta figured out a way and what was this called to reconstruct somebody's nose it's called rhinoplasty rhino as spelled like rhinoceros rhinoplasty rhino means anything to do with the nose and what was the reconstructive surgery for the ear called it was called otoplasty they could have easily just called it ear plasty but of course uh, they everybody nowadays particularly when europe went into the uh, into a position of power everything had to be done in latin so instead of quietly calling it ear plasty they called it otoplasty fine so otoplasty rhinoplasty and does this story remind you or bring to mind some other story from another from an indian epic when i say cut off nose and ears yeah that's right from the ramayana what did lakshmana do to shurpanakha when she came rushing at sita she he cut off her nose and ears and that was such a humiliation uh, to to inflict on anyone that her brother was so upset and that led to the whole war right yes exactly vidya kamath has answered that it's rama and that's right so you can answer in the chat window if you like you know i can see that okay anyway so uh, so sushruta was a master at these two things but the other thing that he was also a master of was and there there was a clue in the picture i showed you but i'll go back to that picture now uh let me just go back to that picture and then you can uh answer it yeah can you see it can you can you there's a clue there so can you tell me what he might have been a master of that's right he was a master of eye surgery or cataract surgery okay and uh and he was the first in the world to do this and i wanted to show you a picture of the eye and explain to you what a cataract is and also what sushruta used to do okay and i want you to observe in the first picture that is the left hand side of my slide of my slide uh, to me it's looking like left hand side of the slide uh there are other assistants involved so i just want you to observe what they're doing and we'll talk about it later now let's go to this diagram of the eye can you see my uh, shweta can you tell me if you can see my mouse here i can yes i can yes okay so that's good so i'll point out using my mouse so this is a cross section of the eye i don't know how old the children are who are watching but some of you might have already studied it in biology class so if you uh, cut open uh, an eyeball in half this is what you would see this is what your eyeball is like so the, the important things that we need to talk about here are the fir first is this part the cornea which is the clear film that covers your eye okay that covers your eyeball you can see it uh, then there is this thing called an iris the iris is the color of your eyes that is what provides a color the round the circular thing in the middle of your eye which could be uh, most of us indians have dark brown black light brown but you know there are blue eyes there are blue eyed indians also but in the west blond haired people usually have blue eyes or green eyes uh so that is the color of the iris so i mean that is the iris that colored part and in the middle of everybody's iris is a dark spot a dark dark spot black completely black and you could think of it as you might have imagined that it was a spot but it's not a spot it's actually a hole and the hole which is not marked here unfortunately in this diagram this hole is called the pupil okay and the hole the pupil is through which light enters our eyes and at the back so this whole eyeball is kept round and circular and solid because it's filled with a gel called vitreous humor that allows your eyeball to maintain its shape it's called vitreous humor and then at the back here is the screen called the retina on the retina is where the picture forms so if you look at this picture the second picture right you can see suppose you're looking at a tree what actually happens there are rays of light that leave from the top of the tree from this part of the tree this part of the tree everywhere and the rays come towards your eye can you see them entering through this hole called the pupil this is the iris but through the pupil i mean this is obviously much exaggerated the pupil is actually very small that you can see and uh, it enters through here and here when it enters the eye it comes across what the first obstacle it hits is a lens it's called the lens 
and it's not an obstacle at all to light because it's transparent so the light goes through the lens but because it goes through the lens it gets bent the rays of light get bent and when they bend like this on the retina the screen the movie screen at the back of your eye the image is formed but ulta it's formed upside down now how does your brain figure out that this upside down something is a tree well that's because that image those images taken through this thing called the optic nerve the optic nerve through the optic nerve it reaches the brain the brain processes it and figures out that it is a tree wow so much happens every time you look at something and still a lot of scientists haven't been able to explain how we see exactly this is the mechanics of it but how does the brain figure out that that is a tree that is the eternal mystery we still don't know anyway so some of you might have had grandparents who have gone through cataract surgery i don't know but it's quite common now it's nothing to fear many people have it and it, it's a problem of age as you get older what happens what actually happens when someone says i have i have cataract it means that this lens this clear beautiful lens through which light was passing through so beautifully when you were a young child or a young person has started to become foggy and dusty and musty and finally it becomes opaque it becomes hard and opaque once it becomes opaque what happens to the light it enters through the eye through the pupil and actually stops it stops it cannot go to the retina which means what happens to you you become blind effectively you can't see because the light doesn't go through at all so today if you are when this happens uh what a doctor what a surgeon will do is he will remove this lens this natural lens and he will put in an artificial lens that is made in a laboratory and you will be able to suddenly see so clearly even if you've had short sight or you've had to wear glasses as a child or a young person once the surgeon replaces your natural uh, defective lens because you know if you have shorts if you need glasses means your lens is some or some part of your eye is defective usually the lens is either too long or uh whatever too concave too convex so once that lens is removed and a perfect lens is put in suddenly you, your eyesight comes back beautifully you can see things that you never saw without glasses before okay so that's what happens nowadays but in sushruta's time like 2000 years ago obviously there was no uh, lab making artificial lenses so what did he used to do what what technique did he come up with to help people with cataract problems you know it was very clever what he did was he used to insert a sharp instrument into the eye and just move the lens out of its place the, the opaque lens he would just push it out of here and throw it into the move it into this eye this vitreous chamber which is full of the gel he would just move it out of its place now if there is no lens what happens to the light here there is no lens opaque or transparent so the light just goes straight through it won't bend like this it will just wherever it goes it will go like this so what does that what is that what then happens an image of some sort is formed it's not a sharp image clearly because the lens is meant to focus the light and produce a sharp image but when you don't have a lens it's a blurry image that forms however even a blurry image is better than no image at all right so even if you can't uh, when the lens is taken away well, like sushruta did it was a it was a technique called couching you could still see if it was day or night you could make out whether it was light or dark you could make out color you could make out that somebody is approaching you you could make out that you are walking into a tree into some some obstacle right so it allowed you the freedom to live a somewhat in more independent life than you would have without that so he was the pioneer of cataract surgery in the world right so that was that and but i now i want to take a little uh, detour and skip several centuries and come back to uh one minute yeah and come no sorry i stopped sharing right so yeah so i uh, want to come back to just what uh what the world was like what would have happened if you had fallen ill not even 1000 years ago but say 3 400 years ago if you were ill first of all nobody nobody in the world until 130 140 years ago nobody in the world realized that it was germs that cause disease how much we talk about germs today i mean it's such a given that germs cause disease but 
nobody knew at all nobody had made that connection which means what did they think was the reason for disease uh, many of them thought it was a curse of an angry god right many of them thought it was just bad blood they said ah people fall ill when they inhale miasma what is miasma just some really smelly bad smelling foggy air which rose in your swamp so they said ah you must have inhaled miasma that is why you're ill okay or they said ha some god or they said your blood but blood has gone bad so what was the treatment then a one very popular treatment which forms the title of my book was to put a lot of leeches on that person and today if you go trekking in the hills in the monsoon and one leech gets into your shoe my god the fuss right all of you are yelling all the kids because i do take children on trips as well and i'm like ma'am we're going to die you know they have a leech have a leech how take it off take it off so but that was the main and most popular form of treatment for disease because they believed that the leeches would suck out the bad blood in your body and make you well again and why is being bitten by a leech so scary to most people today because you don't stop bleeding once a leech bites you and for a long long time and why do you not stop bleeding because a leech is trying to suck your blood but your your body has these amazing warriors that whenever there is a cut or a puncture in your skin and you start bleeding the body's immune system the warriors come together and they throw a net over it and they over the over the uh, cut or the opening and they make sure that the blood coagulates or becomes thick and doesn't flow anymore because they don't want you to lose blood because that could become very dangerous so a leech knows this and the leech is trying to suck your blood but every time it starts sucking these warriors come and they make this net and they make the blood coagulate and thick they can't syrupy the leech cannot suck it through its little straw so the leech has developed a very clever thing what it does <clears throat> when it bites you is it inject something called an anti coagulant which prevents your blood from coagulating so then it can have its full it can have its fill sip as much blood as it wants and when it's fully engorged and fat and you're like ah oh, look at this leech it looks so ugly disgusting and you're screaming mummy mummy at that point it disengages itself and falls off because it's replete it's had a great meal so it is finished but the anticoagulant is still in your blood that's why you keep on bleeding your body's warriors cannot stop it for not forever but about 5 minutes but it's very alarming for us to see blood not stopping because we are so used to blood stopping that is why uh, people get very scared of leeches so it, that was the treatment basically for uh, thing that was one of the treatments if you had a mental illness right even as much even as recently as 200 years ago mental illness means maybe it could just be that you were a little depressed or you were acting a little different a little uh, too sad or too happy or just different from everybody else nobody knew what to do you were not you know in england only about 180 190 years ago mental uh, people uh, people who had mental illness were called patients until then it was not thought of as a problem that could be healed or or a problem that should be treated with compassion you know what they used to do to mentally ill people or people who behaved a little differently they would send them away to a kind of prison not not a not a hospital to get better but to a prison kind of place where they would never be seen again after that they would not be reunited with their families they would be chained to the walls and their skins would be blistered with acid there would be holes made in their skulls it was called trephanning they would make a hole because again making a hole in your skull doesn't kill you and why would people make a hole in their skulls why would doctors make that was they thought it was possession by a demon possession by an evil spirit that's why this man is woman is acting like this so if you make a hole in the skull that that's a place for the evil spirit to escape yeah this was 200 years ago and and some of the worst places they would charge money to the public to come and see all these mad people come and see them behave like this they would be given electric shocks once electricity was invented to calm them down so this was how mental illness was treated until very recently so it was a very and imagine if you needed surgery right they just had to hold you down and cut off that limb did you see that's what i wanted you to see in that sushruta slide the first one you saw the assistants were holding that man down the patient because there was no such thing as anesthesia it hadn't been invented that was also invented about 160 years ago 
okay so it hadn't been invented so if someone said if a doctor said you're going to get surgery that patient would turn tail and run because he had a better chance of if he was going to die let me die without pain at least what's the point ha having all that god awful pain being uh, you know uh, uh, limb being cut off imagine a limb being cut off without anesthesia they might give you something to drink to dull your senses some narcotic to make you feel it but that was about you would not be fully out and sometimes they would give you too much of that and that itself would kill you so all these awful things used to happen and why did people not realize that germs cause disease because until about 350 years ago nobody had ever seen germs they did not that entire universe of tiny tiny creatures nobody knew they existed because why because there were no microscopes so the microscope was a huge huge invention but even after the microscope first the telescope was invented that everybody knows like they say galileo invented the telescope that is quite who invented the microscope it's much contested we don't know magnifying glasses were there lenses were there through which you could look at things but a microscope has two lenses the putting together of the two lenses that that's called a compound microscope that happened um, much later i mean only in um, somewhere in the 1500s 1600s early 1600s was when uh, people like robert hook you might have heard of him if you have studied in biology the, the 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 scientist who first saw cells under a microscope and called them cells named them cells otherwise nobody knew what things were made up of the small small things uh, so robert hook then there were some two three dutch glass makers lens makers they have been credited with the making of the microscope galileo himself invented a microscope he in fact named this thing a microscope but none of these <clears throat> were as powerful as a microscope invented by a dutch cloth merchant sometime in the 1670s cloth merchant he was not a doctor he was not a scientist he was a cloth merchant okay so let's think about that let's talk about that story about him uh so that story uh, so first of all this uh, robert hook he began to he, with his microscope he began to nobody figured out nobody common people didn't understand so what's so great about microscope what what can you do with it okay fine some scientific discovery we don't know what you're talking about but robert hook he was a, he was called the english leonardo da vinci very very talented genius so what he began to do was put things under his microscope he would put a leaf he would put a dragonfly's wing he would put the leg of a louse you know lice that you get in your hair the leg of a louse the antenna of a bee you know he put these tiny tiny things under his microscope and then he could see the structure very clearly just everybody else also was seeing it and saying oh wow how could you know i can see but what robert hook did he was also a fabulous illustrator fabulous artist like leonardo so what he did was he began to draw each of these things really beautifully on large size paper and the royal society of england which was set up in the 16 1660 i think to help people practice science a practical science they published this book okay and suddenly a lot of common people had access to oh my god you can see all this under a microscope you can see this much detail about the small things suddenly everybody wanted a microscope okay now across this robert hook is english british and uh, in the continent in europe in in the netherlands there was this dutch cloth trader called antony van leeuwenhoek let me show you his picture one minute i will share my screen again no one sec sorry do you see this no no you're not seeing no, not this yet. not, not yet. yet one one sec one sec yeah uh, screen share yeah this man can you see now um, not yet yeah no i can i think it's loading yes yeah, yeah it's loading all right okay so this was antony van leeuwenhoek i thought i have to show you his name otherwise you'll never remember and you'll never be able to figure out how it is spelled such a strange name anyway so antony van leeuwenhoek and he came up with this microscope this was the microscope okay this uh, tiny thing it was 5 cm and he was just a 
curious man who loved inventing things. And why he invented this microscope is a very, very lovely story. See, he, the Dutch are famous for being very stingy and always wanting value for money, value for that is why that's where the term going Dutch comes from. When, when you go Dutch, when you go out for a meal and you say, let's go Dutch with your friend, that means each of you pays for your part of the meal. Nobody's treating the other one. And that is why that comes from the Dutch being very, very uh, stingy about their money. Anyway, so because he was a trade a cloth trader and he had to buy from weavers and the weavers would say, oh, sir, it is so finely woven, this cloth. So many threads are going vertically. So many threads are growing, going horizontally. The warp and weft is so close. It's a really fine piece of cloth. And that's why you should pay me this much money for it. So Leeuwenhoek said he was anyway a curious man and an inventor of many things. So he said, let me invent, one, let me figure out one microscope where I can actually check if the threads are that close so I can make sure they are not cheating me. And that is why Anthony von van Leeuwenhoek invented the microscope. But the good part was that, uh, let me come back to my screen. Sorry, I can't see my screen <laughs> one second. Ah, so the, the wonderful thing was that his microscope was 50 times or more had bigger magnification than any other microscope at that time, including Galileo's. He was just a curious inventor, but he, had, he was not a scientist. And then when he so when he made this very powerful microscope and he came across Robert Hooke's book, he had never, never, ever thought of putting a dragonfly's wing under his microscope. He was only putting cloth under his microscope. But when he saw this, he said, oh, I should also get all these things. So he got many things and began to look at them. He began to look at pond algae. He began to look at anything. Suddenly his curiosity was aroused and he was seeing things. And when he put one of something that Robert Hooke had seen under his microscope, he saw something that blew his mind. He saw an entire universe of small, small moving things. They were existing there. They were all around him. He suddenly, he could not believe his eyes that a whole universe of tiny Lilliputian things that nobody had seen till then was suddenly visible to him. And he therefore discovered germs, the first germs, okay, now what we call germs today. And, but even, so he, he was like, wow, and he just told a friend of his who was a scientist. Scientist friend said, oh my God, you must write about this to the Royal Society. And he said, well, I'm just a trader, a cloth trader, as if these scientists will believe me. But he said, no, you have to. And then he wrote off to them and they said, oh, wow. And then they wanted to know how he made his microscope, etc. Then a few years later, or maybe 1676, he looked at some pond algae under the same thing. And he saw things thousand times smaller than anything he had seen before. Anthony von Leeuwenhoek had discovered the first single celled organisms. Even they became visible to him. So this was a great discovery. And when he wrote to the Royal Society again saying, hey, you know what? I found something thousand times smaller. They really doubted his sanity. So they actually sent somebody to the Netherlands to go and visit him and see, is he is he OK? Like, is he just talking through his hat or is he mental and and um, or is he fine? And then they said to the scientist who was going, please, you check it out for yourself. But once they did, they made him a fellow of the Royal Society and our the Anthony van Leeuwenhoek was so done with scientists by the time he said, ah, I'm not going. So he never went to the presentation and never accepted the fellowship of the Royal Society because then who's going to travel to England for that? I have a business to run. So that was Anthony von Leeuwenhoek. But even though he discovered these small, small germs and everybody else began to make those microscopes and uh, human understanding and knowledge was increased a hundredfold, nobody actually con connected these tiny, tiny things with disease. That would take another... 200 years until Louis Pasteur, the French chemist, finally made the connection. He said, do you know that it is uh, these germs that cause disease? And do you know, I'm just adding another bit of trivia to you, that we talk about the coronavirus. We talk about virus so casually today. And the smallpox was also caused by a virus. But the very first time a virus was seen, because a virus is even smaller than bacteria, and it's not it's not about the size of it, but what it does that because it's it's not alive and it's not dead. It's somewhere in between. Bacteria are living things. Viruses are not really living things. I mean, they come alive in our cells, but if you take them out of our cells, they are they don't live. They are they are sort of they are in suspended animation. They they are not dead, but they're not alive either. They are just there in coma. Okay, so viruses were first discovered when when do you think? 1892 
less than 130 years ago, we didn't even know that viruses existed. And now how they dominate our lives from the common cold we know is caused by a virus. Right. So in every way, viruses dominate our lives. But we didn't know of their existence till 1892. Now, anyway, that's Liu and Hawk's story. Uh, I want to now, of course, the biggest the thing that is act, that is keeping everybody, the world occupied now is vaccine, 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 the vaccine for the coronavirus. So let's talk about the very first vaccination. How was it? How did it happen? So the first ever vaccination, uh, we'll come to that. But I like I told you, we'll go back to smallpox now, the scourge of uh, humanity. It was a terrible, terrible disease. And um, in Europe, nobody had any cure for it at all. So people used to die from it or just get completely disfigured, blind, deaf, all that. Now, one uh, a British woman who was married to the ambassador, British ambassador to Turkey, she had occasion to come and live in Turkey for a few years and with her husband because he was there on appointment. And she had two young children. Her brother had died of smallpox. She herself was badly disfigured from smallpox. And uh, Mary Montague, her name was. And she, when she came to Turkey, she realized that people in Turkey had a way to prevent uh, smallpox from happening. They, they didn't know how it worked, but there was a native medicine that really worked. And then she realized, she found out that in India and other places in the East, this treatment had not treatment, this prevent, preventive measure had been there for a long time. And you know what the treatment was? I mean, what the prevent, what they used to do to prevent uh, smallpox? So they would wait for somebody would have smallpox, right? And you stayed away from that person as far as long as you could because by touching that person's utensils or cloth or clothes or bed or whatever, you could get it. And of course, from being too close, if he sneezed on you or something, you would get it. So they knew well enough to stay away from that person and isolate or quarantine that person with smallpox. But the smallpox, it had many stages. At one point, the rashes would suddenly appear all over the world. Within 24 hours, the whole body would be covered. They would be pus filled and awful. And then after a week or so, they would start to harden and scab up. OK, the pus would all disappear and it become like hard scabs. And at that point, it would begin to fall off. It would scab and then fall off. Uh, and that was the least infective stage of the disease like we have now. That's why 15 days quarantine even today, right? So about uh, 10 days after the uh, smallpox first erupted, the sc scabs would begin to fall off. What they used to do in the East, Turkey, India, all that, they would take the scabs, they would collect the scabs, powder them, make it into a fine powder, and ask healthy people to inhale that powder. Okay, so strange. Inhale the powder, or they would make a cut in a healthy person's hand or somewhere in a thumb or anywhere, wherever and rub the powder into it. So, and then if they did that, most very, very often that person would never contract smallpox, even though he, was, he or she was exposed to it. So how did it used to work? The very same way that vaccines work today. So they had discovered that the virus, they didn't know it was a virus, they didn't know it was a germ, they didn't know anything, but the scabs had a we what really happened was the scabs had a weakened form of the smallpox virus the virus was already gone it had done its work it had done its terrible work and now the weak weak smallpox germs were left in the scabs take those scabs powder them make someone inhale it or rub it into him so that the weak smallpox germs enter a human body enter a healthy human's body what is the body a healthy human if you're a healthy human first the body's first response to something foreign entering is to create an army of soldiers to fight against it however with viruses and bacteria just normal general soldiers usually cannot fight there are specific soldiers for specific bacteria how does your body learn which soldier for which bacteria only by falling ill okay you fall ill then you say let body will say let me try this let me try that didn't work or sometimes you might get it from your mother you know, because she's had the disease, so that information is passed on to you. So your body already knows how to fight certain illnesses. Certain illnesses it has to learn. Like our, none of our bodies know how to fight the coronavirus. That's why that is the problem. So if we are infected by a weak coronavirus, we are somehow able to, our bodies somehow use all the soldiers, figure it out and destroy them. But if you're affected by a very strong coronavirus, it's a problem. And the same thing with smallpox. So this was a way by rubbing the powder, weak smallpox germs into somebody's body or having them inhale it, 
what the doctors were achieving was teaching your body to recognize the germ so once the body because they are very weak the body is able to destroy but once it has destroyed the germ the body keeps it in its rogues gallery you know the picture and says this virus this soldier works best or a combination of these soldiers work best so once your body has learned this it never forgets so the next time if you're if you're exposed to a really strong smallpox virus the body says hey hey it's that guy again and then they get their soldiers together we know what to do and they can destroy it so that is how if you are if this has happened to you if the rubbing has happened to you you will never catch smallpox and this rubbing treatment and um, whatever this procedure was called variolation so she heard about variolation mary montagu she heard about variolation and she had two small children she said my children have to be exposed to this treatment uh, to this uh, what a variolation because i don't want them catching smallpox i am so disfigured i lost my brother i will not have this happening to my children and all the british people as usual said oh my god this is some native medicine let our doctor see we will come up with something why do you want to trust this awful native men they are all such dirty people they don't know anything really you think they know anything but she said no i am going to get it done and she got it done very bravely in the 17 1716 or 1718 or something for her son and then then later there was a smallpox epidemic and he never caught it and she was so proud of herself and then they finished and they went back to um england and she went to england to the to the queen's court a king and queen and said please let's do this this really works please allow me to try this and in front of them she even got her daughter who had been too young when they were in turkey to be variolated and she said see i'm doing it with my own daughter it's important everybody in england should be variolated you know please let's do this the king and queen did not believe but charles maitland who that one doctor the at, uh, who had been in turkey and had uh, you know been in, now was back in england he said okay king and queen let me try an experiment will you allow that so they said what experiment he said see there are these convicts on death row means there are these criminals in prison who are going to be who are going to be hanged for their crimes anyway they are going to die will can i ask for six volunteers from them and variolate them and then expose them to a strong smallpox uh, patient to a patient with terrible smallpox and if they don't catch it they can walk out free if they do catch it and die well they were going to die anyway so may i ask all this was allowed huh, in those times so because like, only the king had to decide not the whole population didn't have to vote on it so they said the king said okay that 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 i don't care anyway they're going to die you can ask them so this charles maitland asked the convicts any of you want to volunteer six of you if if this is a good treatment i'm promising you if it works and you are saved and it, then you can walk free no more dying no more hanging so six people volunteered they tried that experiment and exposed them to a very strong smallpox uh, patient with very bad smallpox in its most infective stage and nothing happened to them after that and they walked away free and that created a huge uh, upheaval and excitement in england and everybody began to be variolated variolated in variolated in england edward jenner was a chap he was born in 1749 he also was variolated as a child because that had become standard practice in england the only problem with variolation was a small number of people would still get the smallpox and die even though they had been variolated and why because maybe the variolation had not been effective enough and may not only get the time, get the disease when they were exposed even through the variolation itself they would die because sometimes the um, uh, virus the germs that were introduced into their bodies were too strong for their body to fight so it was not a 100% safe procedure because you couldn't they didn't know that there were germs inside they would just do it and if the germs were too strong you could catch it and die immediately you perfectly healthy person would have the smallpox introduced into him and die so this didn't inspire much faith people did it because it was royally it was people said you should do but uh, it was not a very popular i mean it was popular but not very safe so edward jenner i'll i'm running to the end of my time i'll quickly finish this i'll do it really fast i might take 2 minutes more um so edward jenner was a doctor and it was 1790s in england he had been variolated he grew up and he was saying how to solve this problem of people dying because of variolation that that cannot be allowed we should figure out something and he was working on a farm he had grown up on a farm and he noticed that there was another disease that milkmaids used to get the ones who used to milk the cows and they used to get it on their hands again it was all these pustules so th that was called cowpox cowpox was not dangerous 
the they would get this pustule then it would go away after some time and they'd be fine but what edward jenner noticed and this is what scientists are like they see things that are ordinary people don't what he noticed was that any milkmaid who had got cowpox once never got smallpox and he said could it be that cowpox and smallpox are so similar one is not so dangerous one is but if you've had cowpox once you never get smallpox so this is amazing what if i take the scabs from the cowpox uh, uh, pustules and introduce them into a healthy person that won't kill that person even if he catches cowpox he'll be fine but he may never catch smallpox so this is amazing this is a perfectly 100% safe procedure and again because it was those days edward jenner didn't have to ask anybody he could do what he liked so he decided okay i'm going to do this he asked for a volunteer an 8 year old boy some milkmaid son or some farm lad poor chap he caught him james phipps he said i'm going to test it on you but i'm i'm promising you i'll only be giving you small cowpox so you'll be safe anyway okay but if he caught smallpox later we don't know but he said and then he there was a woman called sara names a milkmaid she she had to come to the less infective stage he took off the blisters from her and introduced them into this boy he injected the boy with it powdered it and in injected the boy with it and the boy got some mild fevers cowpox but he was okay and then after a whatever suitable period he introduced him to really bad terrible smallpox and he put him in the presence of a patient with bad smallpox anything could have happened that boy could have caught smallpox and died but edward jenner's hunch turned out to be right he did not catch smallpox at all even after full exposure and then jenner said this is what we need to give everybody this is a perfectly safe preventive and he called it vaccine why because vaccine vac vacca is latin for cow that's all vaccine has nothing to do with anything else so he called it variole vaccine variolation he used variole and vaccine because cows and that's why it was called vaccine and later much later this was 1796 almost 100 years later louis pasteur came up with vaccines for tuberculosis for rabies and he decided to call them all vaccines because edward jenner was such a hero of his childhood hero so that's how vaccines came to be so i'm going to stop here because i have completely run out of time i had many many more slides but let me show you edward jenner one minute if i can if you don't mind sure mm. Share screen. Ah, yeah. This is Edward Jenner, and this is May, uh, James Phipps. He's giving him an injection of vaccination, and this was May fourteenth, seventeen ninety-six. The first successful vaccine, world's first successful vaccine. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so I think I have. There's one question, a couple of questions that I think we'll take. Uh, uh, Rupa, just uh, I'll just ask. Uh, for most you answered, but yeah, uh, Vidya Kamal's son, Nishit. What will this pandemic teach us about medicine and science? Where do we go from here? So Nishit is 16 years. Yeah, I think this pandemic. What it teaches us is that. what the science what the science mean science is just another word a formal word to, that celebrates the spirit of enquiry and curiosity that all humans have and the spirit of innovation imagination that we have and our discontent that makes us work towards making this world a better place every day so it uh, i think being in the middle of this pandemic sh shows us suddenly as a as a people as a race of humanity that if we only harness these things uh we will overcome anything i think that's what it teaches us absolutely and it's uh, it was really a fun and interesting session rupa because uh, it was really exciting to learn about uh, all these discoveries and these uh, connections that take place that you didn't know uh, you know that you could uh, uh, yeah, look at it from that way so about uh, reconstruct the surgery about swishrut i never knew all that and it was really exciting and you know i mean i was laughing and then i was going wow so uh, it was great it was a great session so to thank all you. Uh, thank you and to all the viewers who have come in a little uh, later you can see the video on demand in the auditorium section and you can view it any time and uh, thanks rupa uh, uh, for those who haven't read uh, uh, the books you should read it yeah. 
so, yeah, from leeches to some glue. And I was also yeah. remembering a few episodes from Dr. House while I was coming uh, <laughs> to you. So thanks so much. And uh, we you. hope to, yeah, we hope to see you again maybe next expo as well. So thanks so yes, much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Shweta and the uh, Bangalore schools. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Bye. See you everyone. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> Bye. How do I log Bye. out? Just uh, close it, yeah. Close it.